we have an obligation to choose over all of the of the distractions in life. God's way. It's not a boring way. It's not a it's not a yucky way to live. It is the most glorious and powerful and life giving way I know. Because when things get hard, God is there. When we get so weak that we don't know what, and so confused we don't know what to do, God is there. He never forsakes us. And we've got to remember not to forsake His covenant. Not by word or deed or, or anything. We've got an obligation to die to our sinful self as Christ has told us, like a seed. We've got to die so that the seed will grow. And then we need to share in Christ's suffering. Paul said, I, I realize that the suffering of this world is not to be compared with the glory of heaven. And when I'm with you, I feel the glory of heaven. When I'm with you, I experience a little bit of heaven. And it's worth all those boxes that I had to up a little bit in my back. It's worth all the misunderstandings that, that happen from one time or the other. And all the people I keep calling Mary that's actually named as Francis. You know. It doesn't matter whether it's little suffering or big suffering. We have we have brothers and sisters that are in the last stage of cancer, that are living a life of glory and power. And it hurts to see them hurt. But God is with us there. And we have an obligation to lift up God, Christ and His power to everyone. Now the Matthew passage. It's another parable. It's a parable of what happens in the world, but it's a parable of judgment. Yes, there's always going to be people who want to cause trouble. People who want to come between a husband and a wife. People who want to, to mess up marriages or families. People who want to, to just take the joy and the power out of life and tempt us and destroy our hope. It's been that way since all of creation. The devil's been roaming this world from one end to the other, just seeking those he can snare. Those he can wrap his, his evil and his hate and his greed around and just squeeze the life out. Just like weeds can squeeze the life out of good, good wheat. And it's confusing to all of us why do bad things happen to good people and why they're tragedies and why the bad guys uh, seem to win. We the righteous would like to go in, in God's name and, and just wipe out all the bad people. Wipe out all the, the evil in this world. And God says, no, that's not your job or my job. Our job is to grow. To grow in the power of God. To let the seeds of God's love and mercy grow with us. And realize that at the final time, there will be a judgment. There will be an accounting for everyone. And God knows what's in our hearts. God knows our struggles and our... Right, let me stop a minute. As Methodists, we believe in backsliding. Okay? Now, I don't want y'all to go practicing that too much. But it does mean that there are times when even when we are intent to be the best role model, the best witness, we fail we fail miserably and we sin before others and before God and, and we are ashamed of that. But God is faithful. He's just. He'll hear us when we confess these sins and He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's God's love at work. So never be discouraged. Never be discouraged in this life. But realize that there will be a judgment. That there will be a time when we stand before God. And I don't know whether he's going to show it on a big screen our whole life and all of its 
glory and not so glorious parts. But God judges the end of the story. The end of a life. Not the beginning, not the middle, but the end. And there's a subtle caution or warning to all of us not to take God's judgment into our own hands. Not to feel so smart and so brilliant and so righteous that we can truly judge another person better than God. If God's going to wait until our life is finished to judge us, then we shouldn't judge ourselves, we shouldn't judge other people. We should live according to the promise the best way we can with the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Are y'all keeping the uh, uh, I haven't confused you too much. God made a promise that he's never broken. And every time a generation of people have broken it, the consequences have been terrible. But God has heard the cries of the people and he has delivered them from bondage to sin and death. He's done that over and over and over again. And he will do that in our lives. No matter what situation we're in, when we cry out to our God, He hears us. And He will answer. It's just that God's ways are greater than our ways. And they're higher than our ways. And we're never going to fully understand them. But never forget this one thing. God is love. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. For God is what? God is love. And y'all said it like you worry. God is what? Love. God is what? Love. Good morning, North View. God is love. I want to finish this message with a with a little story about promise. When each of our sons were entered in that wonderful stage called adolescence, which of course there is no indication as to when it is, but it happens to all of us. When they were reaching adolescence, I took each one of the boys to their favorite eating place and for the talk. The talk. Okay? And if you want to know what that is afterwards, we'll go into that. Okay? Uh, but it's not clear to me. I gave them a memento that was special to each one of them to remember this time together. For Stephen, it was a pocket watch because he really wanted a pocket watch. For Nathan, he wanted a knife. He liked knives. So I got him a nice pocket knife that, that he would be able to keep with him. Carl, it was a tiger's eye. He liked a tiger's eye. I, it was just, each one of them had something special. I explained my personal commitment to them to try to be personally pure in, in thought and in spirit and body, to be spiritually pious, to try and, and live scripturally holy life. And that I made a commitment that my, my life would have a godly purpose that I, I would be the best husband, I would be the best father, I would be the best pastor that I could possibly be. We agreed that these were going to be commitments, that they would look, work towards personal piety and spirit, personal purity and spiritual piety and godly purpose. And then we ended lunch, and I ended lunch with the same basic phrase. It was a statement and a request. I said, son, I know you're going to be making your own decisions regarding your commitments, and you're going to take your own way. And it may not be the way your mother and I have planned for you. But I ask you to make one last promise, and it's the most important promise of all. Promise me that at the end of your days, you'll be there. You'll be in heaven. That's all I'm asking is you promise to be there. Whatever road you take, whatever choices you make, be there. And our youngest son is there waiting. He's there. 
And every time things get a little rougher, or, or one of my sons seems to be a little further uh, from the path, and they see that look in Dad's eyes, they say, Dad, I haven't forgotten. I promise I'm going to be there. That's what I want to ask each of you. No matter what you hear from me or from this pulpit now and in the future, the choices you make will be different. They'll be your choices. And some of them will be good and some of them will be lousy. But God will never forsake you. And I'm just asking you, no matter what path you take, that you'll be there. I'm going to be looking for each one of you. And I'm going to expect us to be there together. We are in the house of God, the gate to heaven. And we serve Almighty God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, life is so difficult without you and so beautiful with you. How is it that we can never seem to remember the crucial point? But this day, Lord, we rededicate our lives to be yours, body, soul, and spirit. I am yours and we are yours, Lord. Everything we are and everything we got, everything we ever will be. Thank you for your words and for the witness and the love of those around us. For the possibilities that are ours in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen.